Hello, beautiful people. Today, I thought we would do something a little bit more fun. We're going to play a sort of game. And if you're watching live, you can be part of it. If you're watching on the replay later, that is a okay. You can play along in your own head and see if you would agree with the majority opinion. Okay. So what we are going to be doing is we are going to be playing um, unpopular opinions in healthcare. And we're basically, it's going to be lighthearted. It's okay if we disagree. We are here for discourse and discussion of a lighthearted nature. We're not going to be tackling, we're not going to be going deep down into things and having solving the world's problems today. What we're going to be doing is just seeing what some unpopular opinions are out there. I have so many of them and going over them, we're going to vote. Okay. We'll go over the rules in just a second. The prize is um, pride and it's just going to be a good time. The whole point of this is just to see different opinions and kind of banter about them, have community discussion and just have a little bit of a lighter chat and discussion. So hello, everyone who is watching live. I appreciate you being here. Sophia, thanks for being a channel member. I appreciate you. Um, if you are a channel member, you can comment with so we uploaded special emojis for this game, I got very into it, where you can either agree or disagree. So you should see that under your emojis, if you open your emojis on YouTube. So if you are a member, you get to vote with those if you would like, if you are not a member. Um, then you can just say like thumbs up, thumbs down. We're going to be rating responses. Okay. So if you're brand new, welcome. I'm Liz. I'm a family nurse practitioner and uh, I have all the appealings, all the appeal, uh, feelings and opinions just came out as appealings, which is interesting, but <laughs> where I have all the feelings, I have many unpopular opinions and today we're going to find out yours. So I pulled you guys over on Instagram and on the community tab here. We got lots of opinions. <laughs> I'm excited to dive into them. Here's how we're going to let this go. Okay. I will share an opinion. I'm going to start with two of mine that I feel pretty passionately about that are, I know are unpopular and we will then vote and discuss as a community. And if you agree with the opinion, you'll give it a thumbs up. If you say, no, Liz, I don't agree with that opinion. That is unlike. I don't agree. You're going to thumbs down and then we're going to vote and we're going to come to some consensus. Okay. And then when I rule the world, we're going to take all of this information and we're going to go build an empire with it. Okay. So that is how we're going to run today. Again, hopefully it's fun. Feel free to be snarky in a respectful way, of course, but we're here just to enjoy ourselves today. Uh, hello, nurse Corky. We have James Connolly. Hello. Who said Kate munch grab ASMR. I'm so glad you made it to a live. Oh, I'll have to check out your ASMR channel. I love ASMR. Um, what kind of ASMR do you do? I don't like mouth sounds. I don't like that. Uh, so if you do that, never mind. Just kidding. Um, Android uh, Vinyas Gonzalez Vinyas said, "You got this." Well, thank you. You got this, two friends and mama nurse. Hello, hello. All right, are we ready for the first unpopular opinion? Are we ready? Brittany McDonald. Hello. Hello. Excited for this video. Brittany, you get special emojis in case, um, Brittany's a channel member. If you're a channel member, you get random video perks and, um, my eternal love. So that's the perks right now. Um, and random video reactions and you get emojis, special emojis for these types of things. So shameless plug, if you want to be a channel member. Okay. Let us go and see, I can't find my, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Are you ready to go? I'm excited to see what emojis you guys pick for thumbs up and down. First up, our first unpopular opinion by Liz. <clears throat> IV hydration spas are a scam. So let me know what you're thinking about IV hydration spas. Are you thumbs up? Are you thumbs down? And then we'll get our consensus statement. I'm going to tell you why. All of these, I'm going to give you commentary. And then I will discuss your commentary that I see in the comments as well. Because obviously since I have a lot of opinions, you all need to know about all of our opinions about all of these things. CS, CCT, I agree. See, we're already winning. Uh, so I don't like IV hydration spas because you can just drink water. Okay. And if you need vitamins, then, well, you should just take vitamins. Most people are not depleted to the amount where they would need IV, uh, Nutri like IV nutrition. Also, it's terrible for your veins. This is the thing I don't think they talk enough about is every time you go and you get the vein, like an IV put in, you're scarring your vein tissue, right? And you're exposing yourself to the opportunity to have infection. You can get phlebitis. Like this is not a minor thing. So why are we scarring your whole arm up for these random bags of vitamins that you're going to pee out? And these are so expensive. And the thing that really gets me heated about these things are they're usually run by nurse practitioners. And I feel like 
it's embarrassing. Okay. I'm sorry if you run these things. <laughs> Sorry. Um, once again, just my unpopular opinion. You don't have to agree. Okay. Um, if you like them, please let us know in the comments what you like about them. Do they just make you feel really bougie? Because that's really the only thing I can think of. Some people are like, oh yeah, I feel like a little bit more energized, but like, wouldn't you also be energized if you drank a ton of water? Like, and okay, sure. So you got some B12 in there, but like, aren't there other ways to get it? It just seems very unnecessarily, uh, just, odd. Um, I totally get that. It's like, you can make bank with it. Right. Um, but it just seems sleazy and I don't like, I don't like that. It's so run by nurse practitioners because I feel like it makes us look as a profession, just kind of like we're out here for the fluff. You know what I mean? I don't love it. Uh, it's kind of in that same vein of, um, I, have seen different things. There's one in our area where we used to live and they did uh vein, they did like IV hydration type spa type things. And they did uh, what they called Yanni steaming, which was um, just steaming basically your nethers, uh, which sounds terrible. And that was also done by a nurse practitioner. It was like two nurse practitioners that partnered up. And I just wanted to like my head, it wanted to explode. I was like, what are we doing here? So that would be my, I mean, I don't think that's an unpopular opinion. Please don't steam that body part. Um, okay. If it requires pr like protective clothing, um, if you wear underwear on top of it, don't steam. <laughs> don't, don't steam. Okay. Don't do that. Um, Brittany McDonald's that I feel like the main way I've seen them advertise is a hangover cure, which makes them scammy to me. Yeah. Friend, just drink some water. Okay. Drink some water, go and eat a meal that whatever your tummy seems to want. Like if you are requiring IV hydration that frequently to like function, no, like all you need to do is just get it out and pee. So no, definitely no. Who said Kate said scarring veins and exposing yourself to infection. No, thanks. I'll drink diluted Gatorade. Exactly. Like, and the, I just can't get over how expensive they are, especially if you go to people's house, um, and go also second opinion says just for my sanity to remember that thumbs, remember thumbs down to disagree with the statement and thumbs up to agree with the statement. Okay. We're, we're laying more ground rules. Okay. So if you agree with the statement, IV hydration spas are a scam. This is a thumbs up because you're saying yes. That unpopular correct opinion is correct. And you, you say now, then you say no. Um, so we have, hold on, technicality between um, second opinion. Second opinion, you can either just say yes, um, agree or disagree in the chat, and um, we will roll it from there. So I think I see this one. So James says, same with oxygen bars. Yes. Did we have anyone, does the chat see anyone that actually approves of IG hydration spas? They are on trial right now and they're about to really, really fail. So if anyone has any points in favor of IV hydration spas, other than you can make a ton of money, please do let me know. Your opportunity to appeal um, is going to be gone in five, four, three, two, one. This is going down forever as something that will not be allowed to exist in the universe once I rule it. Okay. Ready? Sounds good. IV hydration spas are a scam. Cool. Okay. I'm glad we all solved that. Perfect. So that's what happens after we do those. And if you disagree, if we disagree with the unpopular opinion, it's a thumbs down, but this will pass. IV hydration spas will not be allowed in our universe. Next up and feel free if you're watching this on the replay in the comments, please, by all means do defend your, if you disagree, dissent is allowed. Respectful dissent is allowed. Okay. Are we liking this so far? Do we like this? We've only done one, but you're all here now and you're trapped. So, um, feel free. Like I said, dissent, we can discuss. I'm fine if it gets snarky and a little bit sassy. Um, do we like this or will this be a very short live? Cause everyone's going to be like, I hate this. This is dumb. Goodbye. Um, <laughs> Teresa Madison said scam. I'm an IV specialty nurse and they keep calling me. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> not good. I'm like, why, why all of this? Why, how is this allowed? Next, next up we have do, do I keep hitting the wrong buttons. Um, boom, 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 boom. Aha. Okay. Ready? PA school is better than NP school. This unpopular opinion is brought to you by Liz. Um, so PA school, here's my rationale. NP school, there are so many NP schools that you just have to have a pulse in order to get in, right? They don't necessarily teach, like they, there's not a lot of teaching. There's so much variety because they're not very well managed. Um, I think 
PA school does a really good job of actually teaching. They usually find you your preceptors um, and they just have a much more established curriculum versus in my opinion, nurse practitioner school, it does a bad job. It's kind of a, like I, I went there, obviously I, um, I thought my NP program was okay, but I think overall there were a lot more having watched a lot of my friends go through PA school. I was like, oh, wow, that was like very much more structured. It requires a heck of a lot more clinical hours, uh, which is very impressive and like very necessary. You get to see a lot more. You go on different rotations. You can't like you have to go into class and actually do skills labs, which seems like a very good idea. Uh, and it just... I think it's set up better. Do I think it's perfect? Absolutely not. Do I think nurse practitioner school needs to be a lot harder? Absolutely. Uh, there's, um, and I see James say, but it's full-time and way more money and you make the same salary. Yes. Yes. Um, but, uh, I don't know if NP school should be something that you can then work during, you know what I mean? Like I worked full-time during NP school and I'm not sure that like, <laughs> that's a bonus point. You know what I mean? Like it was good. I needed, like I was able to work, which is a huge, huge benefit. And I don't know if I would have been able to do it without it. However, it was part time. Like it was just, it was lax. Okay. And I am pretty much like, I'm going to go out and find the information. I'm going to go get it. And there were a lot of people in NP school, a lot of NP students that came across my path that I precepted while they were in school. And they, I was like, what, what? No, uh, there's a lot of schools online that just don't have a lot of regulation and you can kind of just like get through and yes. Um, so Teresa Madison said, no, I just did clinicals with the PAs and they are as lost as we are. I agree that they're probably just as lost. I don't think, again, this is not founded in like clinical outcomes, right? This is just, I feel like we could do better. Um, cause I don't think PA school is perfect. I think they're also probably very confused. And, um, like I said, that's just my opinion. I think NP school is a hot mess where they basically are just like, I'm not going to, my teachers didn't really teach us anything. Okay. I don't know if your teachers taught you much in NP school, but it was mostly like you choose your own adventure, go and forth and learn. I feel like in PA school, they at least had some lectures. They had much more on, I had a lot of on campus time, but like a lot of NP schools don't. And that's a hot mess friends. That's how are you going to learn to do physical assessment? Unless someone, if you're like, Oh, I'm listening right here. And they're like, no, we shouldn't be listening here. We should be listening over here. How are you going to adjust that online? Um, online only NP schools. This is, I didn't put this in here as an unpopular opinion, but I don't think they're a good idea. Okay, that's my very, um, I get that it increases access. I get that, but, um, I'm not so sure. Uh, so let us see where we are in terms of everyone. Do we, if you agree that PA school is better than NP school, leave a thumbs up. If you think that that statement is false, leave a thumbs down. We're going to vote while we, uh, hear while we do some dissenting opinions and in the future, when I rule the world, we will maybe tweak NP school as such. Teresa Madison says, oh yes, NP school is a hot mess. Yes. <laughs> June same says, we see more NPs than actual MDs. Some of the MPs have horrible bedside manner for sure. And there are horrible, um, you know, there's people with horrible bedside manner that come from any background. It is absolutely not, uh, like, that's just people in general, right? This is more grading the schooling. Danielle Gayhart said, we have clinical weekend skin, clinical skills lab for my online MP program and a video checkoff assessment. See, I don't like the video checkoff assessment. I won't lie. I don't think that's helpful. I'm like, again, how are you actually seeing where you're listening to and doing all of that for that? And where do you go for your weekend skin, clinical schools assessment? I am interested. Um, to Chandra says, Hey Liz, are other nurse friends going to join live for the discussion today? No. So Tuesdays are my self-centered day, um, where it's just me. Thursdays are our panel discussion Thursday. We are going to be discussing, um, what like kind of like advice for new grad nurses who are entering this sphere in this chaos age where everyone seems to hate nursing. So we're going to be talking about that on Thursday with the panel, and we're going to bring a whole bunch of other people in. Um, but today it's just me. Normally these are late night with Liz's. Um, should we, I forgot to roll the intro. I'll roll the intro because I, I need to obviously. Um, but, uh, that is, um, <laughs> it's not late night tonight because we're just going to pretend like it is because I am going to dinner with my neighbors. And, um, when they were like, do any nights not work? I was like, no, I don't do anything. And then immediately I was like, 
I have a live show on YouTube on Tuesdays <laughs> that I've only, that is two weeks old and I have already forgotten about it. So I'm really sorry. All right, let's roll the intro really quick to orient ourselves. And then we will hop back on getting to the bottom of this opinion. There you go. Night shift has more fun. We'll pretend it's nighttime. Okay. We're going to pretend it is nighttime. Um, Danielle Gehart said Chicago for Chamberlain. Um, this is, it's only on one weekend on one weekend. And we do verbalize in the heart locations for the, for the DTRs. I told my husband to fake if necessary, deep tendon reflexes. Um, see, I don't love it. No lies. And we're not going to beat around the bush today. So, and we don't have to agree on everything. It's nothing against you. Um, if you disagree with me, so feel free to leave whatever comments in the description, like really we're, we're not getting deep into things today. Um, is it advisable to go to mental health NP as a new grad, as a new grad nurse? I don't think you should go to any NP school. Hot take. <laughs> not, we're not voting on that one, but I think you just need to focus on being a nurse for a hot minute. And especially since NP school requires such little clinical hours. Um, curiously, my NP school experience feels as effective as some Ivy league grads. Yeah. I have precepted, um, thanks Teresa. I have precepted many Ivy league and not Ivy league NP students. And, um, it, uh, there's not a, there cannot always be a very big difference. Some of those programs are truly trash. Some of them are really, really great. And some of them, even though they're Ivy league are just not great. CK medic said, I can't speak to which is better NP versus PA, but I will definitely say seeing how short the newer EMT programs are and how much, on, how much is online. It scares me. Yes, absolutely. Did you have to pay for your clinical sites as an NP school in NP school? So it was wrapped up in our tuition fees and I did not, and they found my sites. I think it's total BS. If you have to find your own clinical sites, because that is literally all you are paying for right? If you are paying someone for that semester to teach you, that money either needs to go to the person teaching you the preceptor, um, which most nursing and P schools don't pay for most and most PA schools actually will pay you a statement. And, um, like, why are we paying teachers at the school who aren't even doing anything? It's a whole hot mess. Uh, and it absolutely needs to be changed. You are paying for an education. They need to provide you with the place to get that education such a scam. And more PA schools do tend to find you placements, which is part of the reason why I hold my hot take opinion of PA school is probably better than NP school. However, I chose NP school and I have a whole video of why I chose NP school over PA school, even knowing NP school was probably going to be like, Ooh, this is kind of sketchy. Um, because it was all going to be in family med and I could work during it. So I'm kind of a hypocrite because I, I chose the one that was going to be work more for my lifestyle, even though I knew it probably wasn't going to be quite as rigorous. All right. Second opinion. What is the result on this? Let's take it while we're tallying up the score to see if PA school or NP school, um, if, and which one will have to acclimate to which model in the future when I rule the world. But let's see, as Cat like said, I love my NP school, but PA school, Themes, but PAs seem to come out of their programs a little bit better prepared to hit the clinical road. See, I just agree. I just agree. Um, and I, Sierra CC says an IV hydration company almost killed my 90 year old heart failure, failure patient by giving one liter bag with pressure bag. He had heart failure and a murmur. See, why would you ever? Why? No, just no. That is so inappropriate. <laughs> I feel like, no, if you, why was a 90 year old going to that? Not that they can't, but like, oh my gosh. Um, let us see. Second opinion. Uh, Kim King says, I agree. You need some experience before going to NP school. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Unless we want to really, really, really crank up the clinical hours. All right. Second opinion. Where are we? Agree. by. Oh, interesting. Agree. Okay. It's agree. Well, oh man, I just spoiled our whole results. Everyone's agreeing this time. I've <laughs> Good job, friends. Good job. Let me know when you, let me know when you get tired of my random animations. All right. Now we're going into ones that are not mine. Okay. Let us see which one is the first one for not mine. Oh, interesting. We should always wear masks in the hospital, like from now on after going into after the pandemic, how do we feel about it? If you agree with this thumbs up, if you disagree with the statement, thumbs down, I think that 
Hmm. What do I, I didn't read all of these before I sent them to over to, um, my second opinion and she typed all of these up for me. Um, so I haven't actually seen all of these. So this is kind of good to see them live. I, we always wear masks in the hospital. I don't know because I think it would make sense. Like, why would we want to accidentally transmit anything? Right. It just seems to be more sanitary. I wish we lived in a world where you could just say, Hey, when you don't feel good, put a mask on your face, okay? If you've been exposed to something, put a mask on your face. But there are so, the people just don't care. And so we can't trust people. So my inclination would be, mm, mm, my, okay, in my perfect world, and we'll go with perfect world, okay? In my perfect world, no, you wouldn't need to wear a mask all the time. So I would say disagree, but make it so that it's much more common that like, if you need one, you can put one on. Okay. Like if you're feeling yucky, if you're feeling icky, if you're unsure, then you can put one on. Cause I do enjoy seeing people's like face it. Like I do like that aspect. And I find a lot of comfort in being able to relate to my patients and like smile and try to like comfort them and like sit there and not have to, especially in peds, like the mask hides a lot. And so if you're feeling healthy and fine, like, okay, I get it from a like a like a risk of infection standpoint, but overall, I guess I disagree with this one. Um, if you're feeling like crap, yes, maybe during cold and flu season, yes, but overall, um, no. And Ann Fuller brings up a good point: when you don't feel good, do not go to work. You know, that's just getting meta on a whole different level. Okay, <laughs> that's just just in a whole different place. Um, you know, we aren't there yet. Okay. We're not there. And at the point where we can just say, take care of yourself. Um, we're not there. I think it should be an option I'd wear if I was sick. Yes. Um, I wish I could give you a in-between option, but, um, I only had yes or no. I was feeling, I was going to do an in-between, but I was very, very much feeling dichotomous. I was like, no, we're not going to do one in between. Um, as a Kim King says, as an ICU nurse, uh, we wore them all the time anyway before the pandemic. We should. Do all ICU nurses wear masks all the time? I don't feel like ours did. But I mean, I get it. It makes sense if you kind of can't like think about it. Um, I mama nurse says I was pregnant right before. And during COVID I was wearing a mask before COVID and people were so alarmed by it. See, I wish we could just stop that though. And be like, me, let's have like, let's have it not be weird. Like if you want to wear one cool, if you don't, you don't. And that's fine. James Connolly says, I want the option not pressed to force <laughs> other people to wear them. Um, yes, no, this is just for you. Well, this is a very self-centered universe friends that we're playing in today. We're being like, this is the rule and everyone has to live by it, but really it's just kind of served by me. So you don't have to be too altruistic today. You can be like, meh, no, <laughs> in my world, it's fine. Everything's going to be fine. Um, I think it should be an option. If I'm sick, I pick in between. No, James today we are black and white. Okay. Black and white. Don't make it weird. <laughs> don't make it weird. I feel like we need that on some kind of a shirt. <laughs> don't make it weird. Um, I agree. June same says, I agree. It should be massive is clear and it can be decorated for peds. So the deaf community can read your lips. Yeah. Or, and just a lot of people, it's hard to hear, especially if you have a lot of older patients, it can be really, really hard to hear in hospitals anyway, like, because there's so many beepings and there's noises and it's just loud and it's chaotic and it's, it's a mess. Um, I, who said, Kate said, I live in an Asian American community and masks have always been commonly seen prior to COVID. See, this is what I like. I feel like in a lot of Asian communities and cultures, we have that situation where it's like, if they don't feel good and they're sick, then they wear a mask. Um, like, why can't we just be polite and do that? <laughs> why? I would definitely buy don't make it weird merch. <laughs> Perfect. Please do. <laughs> Maybe merch coming soon. All right. Second opinion. Where are we falling on this? I feel like I already know. Um, I disagree. I don't think we should always wear masks in the hospital, but this got a, this was a good um, arousing discussion. All right, ready? I like that sound. Okay, so good. We have our first disagree. So masks will not be required in Liz's kingdom. Um, please do wear them though. If you don't feel good or you were recently exposed to something. Okay, perfect. If you are over the age of 90, you should not be allowed to be 
a full code. So basically what this means is when you are in a healthcare setting, a code is when, so if your heart or your lungs stop working, we will come and pound on your chest and stick breathing tubes down your throat and do a whole number of things to try to make it so that it will, your body will revive. And it, um, it, if you are over the age of 90, the, a lot of the thought is why are we doing this to grandma when the long-term benefit, like usually mortality will follow shortly after, or it's really, really hard on your body. Like, what are we really gaining? Are we gaining days? Are we gaining, you know, health or are we just prolonging inevitable things here? Um, on the flip side of that, people say, what if they want to be coded and have all of this done, then they have that choice. Cause how can you say, Hey, you aren't allowed to make this choice about your own body. So those are kind of the two sides of this coin here. I think that you should be allowed to be a full code because you are in charge of your own body, right? You should always be allowed to make choices about your own body. However, however, um, I think that this should come with a huge caveat of there needs to be a lot more education about this, right? We need to come in and we really need to say, Hey, this is what this is going to look like. We're going to break all of your ribs. You're going to be intubated. You're going to be paralyzed afterwards. Maybe you are going to have X, Y, and Z. We're going to slam your body full of these medicines that, you know, are going to, who knows, like your it's going to, it can cause all these end organ damage and these issues with your circulation. And there needs to be a much better conversation than just, Oh, Hey, like, Hey, if you stop breathing, do you want us to restart that for you? Because it looks very glamorous for a lot of people or people will have the thing of like, Oh, this is not a messy process. This is just like, boom, boom, boom. Like fine. When I really sat down and explained it to almost all of my primary care patients, cause we would have this conversation with, hopefully I ha tried to have it with all my, com my patients. We talked about what that looked like. Hey, do you want a feeding tube? Do you want this? Do you want this? And usually by the time you were done I like describing it, they were like, Oh, like most of them, if they were older, they said like, actually, no, I'm not sure I would really, like, if I was that sick that this was happening. Um, no, I'm not sure I would actually like want that. Right. I wouldn't want that prolonged suffering. I wouldn't want any of that. So I, I disagree with this because I think you should always have a choice. However, and it's hard to decide, like, how would you decide 90 versus like 80 versus 85? Where are we going? But I would say we need a lot more education on this in order to do this. Okay. Second opinion. Let's tally these up while we go and read some response ones. This is a tough one. I completely agree. I, hmm, I feel you. Um, Let's, we agree. It's difficult. Angela says it is a patient's choice. I agree. I think, um, it does need to be your body, your choice, Paul, we should leave it up to the patient, which we already do. Yes. Yikes. I don't even want to play this one said Aaron. I feel you. Danielle Gayhart said it's a personal choice. Realistically pretty pointless. Yeah. And how would you necessarily know if they're 90? You'd be like checking their wristband. You're like, Oh wait, hold on. <laughs> they don't turn 90 for 12 hours. We can't, we can still do this. I hate doing this, but yes. So agreeing. Um, remembering that if you agree with the statement, it's a thumbs up. If you disagree with the hot take, it's a thumbs down. Uh, Sophia Souza said it depends, uh, agree, but it depends what the patient, uh, has requested. Yes. So kind of going back to choice, Teresa Madison said, yes, no code, uh, over 90 ICU nurse for decades. Do you know how many codes I have done? So many, I bet you have done so many. We are going to do a topic here soon. I think we'll probably bring in, uh, I will probably be a panelist discussion. Let me know if you want it to be a panelist discussion or just a one-on-one -on -one combo or a pre-filmed video, what kind of modality you want for that. I think panelists maybe about how we keep people alive for quantity of life over quality. And we torture a lot of people. Um, I have pretty big feelings about that on, um, both like, NICU side actually. And old, like we just try to, we try to make the body do a whole lot of things that I feel like it doesn't necessarily always want to do. Um, so I'm sure you've seen a ton of codes because pretty much everyone in the moment will vote for a code, right? The panic is something, um, this is why it's so important to have this conversation in primary care. So if you are in primary care as a provider, please advocate for this. If you are a patient and you have not yet told your family members, 
and your healthcare providers, what you would like done if you stop breathing, please have that conversation. It is so much easier to have before anything is wrong, before you are sick so that in these emergencies, your family knows, because it's really hard to make that decision. If all of a sudden grandma gets sick, and now she's about to code, what do we do? Well, you're very emotional in that moment. And you're just thinking, which most people do just save grandma, right? Just do whatever you can to save her. And then we run into all these situations where we're coding people who really don't have a great prognosis anyway. Um, so that's kind of, those are my thoughts there. Um, in Kim's world, I agree, but reality is for most families who want grandma coded, regardless of the outcome. Yes. And I've seen a lot of people change their mind. I've had a lot of family members who had made a family member DNR, which is do not resuscitate, like don't do any of those things. And then when the code actually happened, they changed their mind and they were like, actually, never mind. I can't go through with this. Like you need to go and do something now. James Conley said, but hospitals would lose so much money if we had conversations that were that honest. That's very true. Hey, do you really need to do this complex cardiac procedure on this patient who is, um, you know, really probably not going to get much absolute benefit out of it? <laughs> no, no. Uh, CK Medic said, oh, tough one. I think we need to do better explaining and updating advanced directives. Yes, yes. There are difficult conversations to have, but they are so... I've gotten so much positive feedback in like morbid kind of ways when people come back and they say, Hey, this ended up, uh, happened a lot with my older patients who would come back and they were like, Hey, my spouse passed away, but I'm really appreciative of you making us have that really uncomfortable conversation that we didn't want to have because I knew exactly what she wanted, like exactly, which took a lot of the stress out of a very, very difficult situation. So have the hard conversations, friends practice them. Uh, it does get easier. Um, it should be, Danielle said, it should be talked about more. I've literally had hospitalists and PEs ask me why I was talking about advanced directives with an elderly COVID patient being put on BiPAP from high flow. Like that, if there's ever a time to have that conversation, it's then. But then even then it's hard because that's such an emotionally charged situation. You're probably not thinking clearly, right? June said, I've had a patient with calciphylaxis caused blister, black torn skin. Yeah, so just like nasty outcomes, right, from having CPR and everything. You can have a ton of ramifications from it, a lot of pain. Um, and usually like the six month outcomes are pretty similar. I'm pretty sure. Like you don't really necessarily get much quality of life. Um, so many times the patient is okay, but the family wants the full code. Yes. Oh my gosh. This happens all the time where the family says, please don't do anything. And the family just cannot, uh, Jessica Langston said, if the patient is cognizant, when they enter the hospital, it should be their choice. Agree with Liz about patient education and primary care. It should be discussed and then noted in their record. Yes, yes, yes. Nurse Corky said, agree, education is so needed. Um, Teresa Madison said, curiously, when I put family in the room during codes, someone from the family says stop. And that can happen too. I've seen that too, where it's, um, where in the moment they realize what it kind of looks like because it's not pretty, right? It is, I have a few videos on codes and like, my first one, and then how to kind of handle your first one. I think there's two videos. I'll try to leave them linked down below. They're not pretty. It's messy. It is, uh, it, it takes a lot of work to get that body up and running again. And sometimes people see it and they're like, oh my gosh, this is horrific. Why didn't you tell me? And you're like, well, I mean, because we're bad at education. And again, that would really cut into our profits if we just kind of didn't do all these things to you. Sophia Souza said, my grandpa never ended starting um, staring, starting what he wanted. So my dad had to make the tough choice, stating what he wanted. So my dad had to take the tough choice. And that is such a brutal thing for children and loved ones to have to do is make that choice. Um, really, 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 really hard. Uh, Lottie Crawford said patients, um, choice, but most people should be educated on it. You explained it well. Well, thank you. Um, RS says depends more on health than age. Yeah. There are 90 year olds that are healthier than some 70 year olds. Absolutely. So that's why I think the age cutoff would be really, really hard. Um, but definitely something to look at, uh, a panel discussion would be great for this topic. Perfect. We'll do a panel discussion. CK medic, you single-handedly got to vote for it. <laughs> My grandfather lived uh, to 96 and was healthy as a horse. There were people, I mean, and that's why I think I agree. Like age isn't necessarily a good cutoff. I have had, like, I remember I was, uh, when I worked med surge, we had a 103 year old patient who was in, she had had some kind of, um, I think she had had 
like a, a surgery. Maybe she had fallen and like broken her hip or something and they didn't even want to fix it. But that lady was like out there charging and walk in the halls, like right after her hip replacement, like <laughs> she went home like two days later. She's like, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm going to go do my thing. I have to go home and, um, uh, garden. It was like the summer. She's like my garden, like I have so much to do. <laughs> we were like, Oh, okay. Like she ran that unit. We were terrified of her. She was so kyphotic. Like she was so like shrunken down. Um, she was probably like four, maybe four, eight, four feet, eight inches tall. Everyone was terrified of her, but she was also the most hardcore human. All right. Let us see. Um, who said Kate said my grandfather was coded by mistake. Oh no. Had a DNR. Fortunately he passed peacefully after we were able to withdraw care. I'm glad he was able to pass peacefully. People also get, um, coded, all the time. This happens all the time. And it's so inappropriate, right? This is why having some kind of like uh, better communication, why having so many patients, all of that is terrible because then you don't even have time to like, if you have fewer nurses, there's less time to huddle, right. And be like, we would always huddle at the beginning of a shift, but if it was crazy, sometimes we didn't get to and be like, Hey, here's our DNR list. And then you should have a sign above the bed. You should have a sign on the door. We would have signs on the monitors, like, because if you stumble upon that patient, right, you just walk in, you have no idea if they're a DNR, right? So we need to do a lot better on this because I have been in many situations personally where we have coded someone who was not a full code because things were not labeled properly. And that is a horrible thing to like, just imagine that you are like, Hey, I don't really want anything else happening to my body. And then people do it. I've seen only one patient who this is from shore seen only one patient who ran a full code when they couldn't broken ribs, lacerated organs, patient was miserable in recovery. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like, it's like, what is your <sighs> take on it? Second opinion says, if you're liking this style of video, let us know by improving the vital signs of the video by sharing and giving the like button an odd number of compressions. Okay, let's do, can't do CPR maybe on people who won't have good quality of life, but if you do CPR on the like button, it tells Google you like this. <laughs> Thanks friends. Um, and let's see. Do, do, do. Okay. We have our final vote. Um, let's see what we agree. If you are over the age of 90, you should not be a full code. Will this be a law in the Liz universe? Please hold. It did not pass. Um, we decided that we will give people autonomy over their body and they can choose, but we will be implementing a whole lot more, a whole lot more education on the topic coming your way. Mama nurse says we now have purple wristbands for our DNR patients. That makes a lot of sense. Why don't we just do wristbands? You know, sometimes it's the simple things. Now I'm looking back. I'm like, why didn't we have that as a wristband? That makes absolutely no sense. Um, who said Kate, your grandpa was 101. I love that. I love that. I hope he had a happy, healthy 101. And I'm glad he was, was able to pass peacefully. Um, that is so hard. Uh, oh, okay. People put too much faith in chiropractors. If you agree with this statement, thumbs up. If you don't, <laughs> thumbs down. I am a huge thumbs up on this one. I think people put way too much faith in chiropractors. Uh, I went, I have gone to a chiropractor before and it was for like, remember if you've been here a while, I had horrible ner bedside nursing, just like messed me up. And then pregnancy really messed me up. And it, I went because I was in such bad pain and I was like, is, if this can temporarily relieve it and like get my rib out of whatever is in here and it sort of helped, but it never helped long-term. It would help for like the day that I went and then it never helped. And then I started, I realized I should probably just strengthen my core. Um, they were like, you need physical therapy. And I was like, I can't afford physical therapy. Yay, America. Um, and I started doing yoga though. And that helped a ton, right? Cause that's strengthening your core so that it kind of can just like lengthen and strengthen and decompress some of those vertebrae that were angry. Um, all that to say, this made me really look into chiropractors a lot more. And I'm sure some of them out there are very well-meaning and are very wonderful, but, um, yikes, <laughs> that is not founded, um, on a whole lot of, uh, <laughs> actual outcomes. Um, but I'm sure like some aspects of it, I think can be helpful if you have someone who is very knowledgeable about more of the, I would say the mus muscle type thing, you know what I mean? Like helping loosen with like massage and all that, but the super duper cracking jarring things. No, no, 
no, no, that's scary. So I know some people have gotten a lot of relief from them and absolutely swear by them. I just feel like as the most part, if you want to do it fine, um, it's some people I know swear by them, but I think the ones that crack you and do all the crazy things that's scary friend, don't let them touch your neck. <laughs> like, and the education required is just not, uh, so I'm much more comfortable when they're doing more massage techniques. Um, I have heard of people who did more like gentle manipulation, almost kind of like OMM, like osteopathic manipulation for when you go to a DO medical school that I can feel I can get more behind. I do think there's a lot that can go well when you, you know, just like a lot, like our bodies hold so much tension. And so I do think like learning how to relax and having like massage and all of that can cause a lot of help long-term. It's not really solving anything. I feel like that you can't solve with doing other things like yoga, Pilates, like core strengthening activities that also stretch that seems safer to me. Um, and that was usually what I recommended for my patients. I wasn't like, Hey, never go to a chiropractor. I would give them names of ones to never go to because they scared me. And then ones that were more, a little bit more like gentle. So second opinion, let me know, um, everyone vote and we'll see in the comments what is happening here. Um, and we'll see. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Angela said, I think proper alignment is important. Yes. I totally agree that proper alignment is important, but I don't like how we get there when you're like, <laughs> And they like drop the table and it's just terrifying. Um, I think there's better ways that we can get there. Uh, but I do agree that um, proper alignment is important, right? We need to lengthen our spaces and all of that, but just yoga, yoga with Adrian, my friends, free YouTube channel, bomb.com. If you have Peloton yoga, um, I, there are, uh, I was trying to think of um, my brain. My brain is gone. There's, I was going to tell you my favorite Peloton yoga instructor and my brain doesn't, it's not working. Uh, Sophia said cracking sounds painful to me. Yes, it does. Jessica Langston said can be super helpful, but it's also way overrated and not necessarily con necessary constantly. I had a Cairo want me to come twice a week for three months. Yeah, no. And that was my experience as well was they were like, well, you're going to need to come in like twice a week for a month. And then we'll kind of go down and try to get you to like a maintenance phase. And I was like, mm, mm, this kind of seems like a scam. Um, and yeah, no, they also had a Yanni steaming. <laughs> I was like, why, why are we all into steaming? And this was also run, run, run by a nurse practitioner. I was like, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, who said Kate said a chiropractor fixed my neck pain for only a day or two, but the process had me concerned. Yes. <laughs> Same. Did you hear that? That went to medical school. It's that went to medical school bit. That's just important. Uh, and online versus in person, the clinical requirement hours, um, are basically identical. The online student must be able to focus. This might be going back to the conversation about NP school. Um, let me, uh, mom and nurse says, did you guys see the young lady a few weeks ago who went to a chiropractor after college exams and ended up in the hospital because of burst blood vessels? She had a heart attack as well in her twenties. That is so sad. Oh, that is so, so sad. Um, that you can like get at really bad risk of like all sorts of crazy things happening in your neck. Like I have heard of that where you like strip your carotid or something. That seems terrible. Second opinion says, I think they're good. Sometimes I went once for advice and help with my seamstress hunch <laughs> and he helped with the pain temporarily. But he also told me straight in my backs and shoulders for long-term. See this, I can get behind. This is someone I respect a little bit more because they're saying, Hey, let me help, help you out maybe here in a pinch, but long-term you're going to need to do the work in order to get there. Right. So basically long-term solution is doing that PT physical therapy, building up the strength, working on strength, uh, lengthening, um, short-term solution maybe, but still scares me. A chiropractor who knows their limits can be very helpful for muscle and joint pain. When they start talking about fixing everything that can possibly go wrong with the body through adjustments, run away. That's an excellent, excellent benchmark. I think I had someone once tell me that if your chiropractor, and I have no idea, absolutely no idea if this is true. They said, if your chiropractor has the name family practice in it, you should run <laughs> or spine. They said, if it said family practice or spine, then I was, it was scammy. I have no idea how this person benchmarked that. It was another chiropractor who did like really gentle alignment. And they were the one that told me they were probably just biased and wanted me to send all of my patients to them. Um, but yeah. I had a Cairo, Aaron said, who claimed he could relieve my gallstone woes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, the one that I went to, he started out fine and then definitely gave off like, um, cracker barrel vibes, especially when, uh, they hired the nurse practitioner to start doing, um, steaming. Uh, and I was like, I'm out. <laughs> she tried to like get me to, she's like, I'd love to come in and do an in-service in your office for like, and you can send all your patients over here. I was like, um, actually, uh, my back's better and I'm never coming back. <laughs> but they did do the tens thing with the heat. Oh, that feels so good on your back. So, so, so good. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's round up. Um, do, do, do. All right, here's our vote. Will chiropractors be allowed to fix gallstones in Liz's future world? I don't think we're shocked. Are we shocked? I'm not shocked. I don't think so. Uh, S. Catlig says, I agree. I myself go to a chiropractor intermittently for chronic neck and back pain. However, I have also seen a woman, Cairo, tell me a thermo thermography was okay. <laughs> okay, was cancer. Oh dear, that's not good. That's not good. I thought it was interesting that my chiropractor could order x-rays. I did not know that until we were there. My chiropractor also tried to hire me to prescribe medicine at this clinic, which was also a big red flag. He's like, or you could go over and help so-and-so run our, um, genital steaming business. I was like, I, mm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to leave. Um, all right. Ready, ready. Ooh, Ooh, this one looks fun. Um, I agree with the messy bun ban for nurses going around on TikTok. So if you also, like me, live under a rock, I do know about this one, fortunately. Um, it'd be embarrassing if I didn't be like, what's a messy bun ban? Uh, one of the hospitals of the world recently came out with a dress code that said the messy bun is not allowed, that it doesn't look professional or whatever, and you have to do something different with your hair. And the internet um, did not take overly kindly to this. And they said that this was a ridiculous rule and yada, yada. And there's been a lot of uproar about it. I do think it is quite ironic that um, now people are getting outraged. I feel like this is something that we had at um, the hospital I worked at. We had a lot of people who um, like a lot of black people who weren't allowed to wear their hair natural because it was said it was like unprofessional, um, or people would get crap for having like a band, like a head covering on, um, if they were, um, I'm trying to think of, we had people who, uh, like just a lot of different cultures and everything where people would want to like cover their hair or they just wanted to wear their natural hair or, you know, if you had dreads, if you had anything, then they were like, Oh my gosh, that is not okay. Um, and, uh, they, they like, so I just think it's interesting that now we're like getting mad about it. Um, but anyway, uh, messy bun. I agree with the messy bun ban. I think that's stupid. Wear your hair, how you want to wear your hair. Like, is that really in the midst of all of this? Is it in general, like, does it look fine? I feel like this is one of those rules where we could just say um, that if as long as you are coming to work and you overall look not like you just crawled out of a garbage can, <laughs> then it's fine, right? Like, why are we getting bent out of shape? Why are we, this is not something that we need to micromanage. This just comes off as super duper petty. And um, yeah. <laughs> Why are we worrying about this? So I disagree with this. I don't agree with the messy bun ban. I think you should be able to wear your hair how you would like to wear your hair. I think you should be allowed to have tattoos, heaven, or oh, I know, or a piercing, heaven forbid, like on your face. Oh my goodness. We all know that, um, you know, in case you missed um, Florence 101 in nursing school, you must be have the perfect bun. You have absolutely no markings on your body and uh, you cannot, if you have metal into your face in any way, it automatically makes you a target for central line infections. So in case you didn't learn that in nursing school, that's Florence 101. So there, we're, you got to be like the prim and proper nurse here. Okay. Um, <laughs> let me see. Yeah. It's hair up. Lauren Kelly said it's hair up. It's hair and it's up. Bigger problems are happening in the hospital right now. And that's not <laughs> super tight ponytails. Exactly. I think people who made this law have something other than, um, <laughs> something else is super tight and it's not their ponytails. June same said they should be regulating pay increase, patient, uh, nurse patient state, uh, ra ratio quit admiring, uh, 
admitting patients for the money and instead having divergent plan for the amount of staff that they have to prevent burnout versus what, um, what on earth are you doing with your hair? Ha ha key is not looking like you crawled out of garbage. As long as everyone looks put together, I think hairstyles are fine. Yes. Why? Yeah. Why? 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 Um, make whoever, um, male reveal for whoever made that rule. Yeah. For real. For real. Um, <laughs> there are greater tragedies in life than bedhead. Yes. Yes. And if your patients are a, a, like okay enough to be offended by my hair, um, then you're probably not, you don't need to be in the hospital. Okay. Then you're not sick enough to be here. There are, uh, we're currently experiencing a nursing shortage in case you didn't know of uh, people willing to work because the hospital treats you like crap. So perhaps, um, you should go home <laughs> and free up one of these beds for someone who won't care about my hair. Okay. There we go. Those are my feelings. Um, <laughs> just give Jessica a company. Um, so they want our hair and our faces or our residents faces all day. Exactly. Exactly. Does this go for a messy man bun too? Mm, that is a very, very good question. Uh, I'd rather wear a messy bun than get my ponytail pulled by my confused patients. Yes. I only ever wore messy buns or like my hair braided and then twisted and put up in a clip. And I like one time my manager like did say something about that. She's like, Oh, like your hair's pretty. Like you should wear it down. I'm like one gross, disgusting. Who wears their hair down in a hospital? Nasty. I don't want that falling into anyone. And two, why would I want like, um, she was annoyed that I wore the clip one time because like, she was like, Oh, like that could be like an infection thing. I'm like, I'm not giving someone my braid as a handle to rip off my head. And she was like, just kind of looked at me and I was like, <laughs> don't talk to me after my night shift about how I can wear my hair. So, um, there we go. Okay. Let us, I think we all know the rules on, I think we all can see how this one is coming, but in Liz's future world, will you be allowed to wear messy ponytails to go to, um, work? Let us see. I agree with the messy bun ban, agree or disagree. My, oh, sorry about that. It was disagree. <laughs> Got a little carried away. Um, I need to get one of those. All the cool streamers on the internet have one of those um, decks where they hit the button and it goes, I'm not there yet. I was going to buy one on YouTube or on, um, they were very expensive. <laughs> I was like, never mind. <laughs> Maybe one day. Uh, my only hang up, um, Elizabeth Mullen says, is what exactly is considered messy? When the bun is practically falling out, then I hold slight issue because as someone who sheds, I wouldn't that hair want that hair all over me. Um, fair, but I just think there's less issues <laughs> that we have to worry about. Um, postpartum hair loss hit me hard. Every bun is a messy bun. There you go. Elizabeth said, I don't care about looking professional. I just don't want hair all over me. That's very fair. Um, and oh yeah, no braid pulling and my hair down. Yeah. So in case you've never worked in a hospital, like an environment with patients, don't let your hair down. Uh, don't give people handles. Okay. Just same for earrings. That's why like earrings, necklaces, all of that. Even if your hospital like allows them, do not wear them because people will try to choke you with them and you don't want that. All right. Do, do, do paper charting was better than computer charting. Um, some people, <laughs> going to date ourselves. I learned how to chart. I originally documented as a nurse on paper. Um, I, some of you probably have not, <laughs> this might be interesting. Let me know if you have ever, if you have only ever electronically charted, I guess would be a good way to say that. Um, I have a lot of feelings on this. This is going to require some rumination. Okay. So paper charting. Um, so in case you were unaware, paper charting was how we kind of did things maybe 10, 15, I feel like between 15 and 10 years ago was the switch. It was much less detailed in paper charting, I will say. And now we all go and write, we have the electronical health record and like every billion things has to be documented. You get much more detailed notes. However, the detailed notes require so many more clicks versus before you could kind of just like go down a checklist and go, yeah, 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 yeah. It's fine. Um, could be harder to read very much less detailed because you had to come up with your own words to put into something sometimes, or it was just a blank and you couldn't necessarily like get, if you couldn't think of the word, you know, you just weren't going to write it. You were like, yeah, um, lung sounds bad. They didn't sound good versus now you click on the drop down menu and it's like, here's your 12 choices. And you're like, oh, wow. Um, so a paper charting, um, took less time. It took a heck of a lot less time. 
um, there was less regulation with it, but there was less detail. There were a lot more errors. There was room for errors. Um, and it kind of pains me to say, but I think electronic charting granted I've done electronic charting for a lot longer. I was at my hospital for less than a year when we switched over, but, um, it did, uh, it was so much more room for error. Like when you were reading off all of the medications, when you were reading the orders, there was just so much more room for error in that there were, you could read it wrong. Someone's handwriting could be crappy. You could, you weren't able to give as detailed of an assessment. Um, but you were able to spend more time with patients. I feel like, because there was a lot less nitpicky because now that we can get really specific with charting now it requires all of this, but maybe we can monitor people better. Then it comes down to, do we really have time to chart appropriately? Right? Cause in the perfect world, we're charting a very nice assessment. Uh, but are we really charting it accurately or are we just clicking through to get through our 3000 clicks in a day that we're usually doing? Right. And then it becomes not helpful because you're just copying over what the last person did. And it's not something you can like reliably go back to because the goal, right. Would be that you're like, Oh, weird. Mrs. Jones lungs didn't used to sound like this. Uh, so let's go back and see if it was like that before. And then you're like, Oh, it says it's normal here, but was it really normal there? Or did Sally, the nurse, just have so many patients that she just wrote as normal. So it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but I do think electronic better charting is better. Um, thumbs up. If you think paper charting was better than electronic charting thumbs down. If you disagree with that statement, paper charts gave the insurance companies and CMS less opportunity to deny claims. The charts gave insurance companies. Yes. So there was less, since there was less detail, there was less, they could go after. Whereas now there's so much detail that they could be like, Hey, we saw that, um, in your entire hospital stay, we don't have a do uh, documented turn between the hours of one and 4 AM on Tuesday, the 23rd. So, um, that is the reason why this patient got a pulmonary embolism was because you didn't document that you turned them that one time versus before maybe you didn't, you didn't have to document turns every two hours. There was a check mark and it was like, did you like, did you turn them this shift every two hours? And you were like, I sure did. Now you have to document it. So many, many pros and cons. Um, uh, I'm annoyed. I didn't get the notification and lost track in time of myself. Well, hello, Mel. I'm glad you're here. Um, Kelly cake. I left someplace that had an unholy abomination of combo between paper and electronic. So many things got missed. They were both bad in both ways, but electronic actually had positives. Electronic does have a lot of safety features. I agree. Um, and a combination sounds like hell. I cannot imagine having both. I worked, I did clinical at a hospital that was transitioning. And while I was there, we had both and it was a hot mess, hot, hot mess. Uh, never done any paper charting. Uh, it sounds like it takes too long. Disagree. Sophia. It did. Well, there was just less. Um, we did that. I like it. June some said, same said, I like it. If we have a storm power outage and have to send patients to different facilities, they can just take the paper, the transfer me transfer might not have gone through. That's very true. Uh, I also, it was always interesting <laughs> to see, um, how no one knew what to do with anything. Like I very quickly was one of the only nurses that knew how to fill out like a paper rec for labs and stuff. So normally when, you know, labs, you're ordering labs, you'll just go and now do them electronically. But I was very used to doing that on paper, uh, cause I had to do that on paper for a while. And then people were, confused. All right. Second opinion. Let me know what, if paper charting will be brought back, um, and allowed in Liz's future universe. Uh, Shore said paper chart. Do they have a pulse computer? What are the names of their great grandma's dog? <laughs> so true. So in, on like paper chart, do they have a pulse was like the, you know, um, the standard, like, is this patient alive? And now it's like on the computer. It's like, please tell me about the last time. What was the name of your great grandma's dog? Please tell me the size, shape, consistency of your last poop. <laughs> You're like, why does this matter? All right, friends, the verdict is in paper charting was better than computer charting. And overall, three. That's surprising. So I'm not telling this. My uh, second opinion is telling this. So um, we might be going back to paper charting. <laughs> good luck, everyone out there. Good luck. Um, good luck. Uh, Kelly said she, I like how my records come to me with every provider I see. However, the patient was on a regular diet last meal and the doc hadn't updated the order. Why do I have to chart it yet again? Fair. Uh, 
Teresa Madison says, yes to paper. Electronic is full of BS cut and paste. Paper took much less time. I agree. Well, Teresa, you'll be happy to know that in the future universe, the Liz universe has decided that paper charting is the way to go. So go forth confidently. Um, we all have something new to look forward to and learn in our future. Okay. Uh, let us see. Um, okay. The BSN is a complete joke. So the BSN, your Bachelor of Science in Nursing, is a baccalaureate four-year degree for nursing. So there's many different entry points into nursing. And um, in, uh, you can be, have your ADN, like the basic rundowns. You can have your ADN, which is like a community college degree, an associate's degree. You can have your BSN. You can bridge between the two. Really, the biggest difference between your ADN and your BSN is that more hospitals might be able to might hire you because there's a whole hierarchy in nursing where the um, you know people who lobby and pay a bunch of money would like you. They're in it with the you know the schools. This is my conspiracy. That's not really a conspiracy. It's kind of fact where they are all together in like bed together. And so they want you to be able to, you know, pay the schools to have to go get this BSN, but you don't really learn anything in your BSN. It's kind of your fluff classes. You learn all of your core nursing things in your ADN program. And then in your BSN program, you learn things like professionalism, where you learn about not wearing your hair in a messy bun. Um, you learn a little bit more about like leadership uh, and you just fluff. Okay. Research maybe community, like things that could go, like, I like the idea of having more, my gosh, I just looked down and my whole leg is bloody. Oh, good luck to me. Um, <laughs> like, why is there blood everywhere? It's gonna be fine. Um, I'm okay. I have poison ivy that's itchy. I'm on steroids and it's a mess. They made me so rageful last week. We're going to just take a quick detour into that. Um, since I feel like I can't just say, oh my gosh, my leg is bleeding and then leave you without anything. So I went into the woods the other day, like two weeks ago, stupidly. Um, I was like, for some reason I thought I will, I, I'm invincible. I don't need to wear long sleeves and pants, even though our woods is covered with poison ivy. And that was stupid. I, uh, so I got poison ivy and it was just up on close your eyes. Don't watch, skip ahead. <laughs> this doesn't look that bad. It looked horrible before on my arm right here. And I don't do well with steroids. So, and it wasn't that big. It wasn't all over. And, uh, I was like, this is fine. I'm going to be a typical primary care person and deal with it myself. Um, and then it got a lot bigger <laughs> Then it got a lot worse. And then, um, at like day seven, I was like, all right, this is getting really bad. So I called for cream because I don't, it was getting like all over my stomach and all over my arms. And I was like, I um, really need to get this addressed. So I asked for triamcinolone cream at my like doctor on call thing. And they gave it to me. They're like, you really need systemic steroids. I was like, I don't need systemic steroids. I really did. If it was my patients, I would have said, you have to have systemic steroids, but I don't do well. I get like really rageful um, and really emotional and really stressed. So it's kind of like the worst PMS ever uh, mixed with menopause. Um, and even though I've never had menopause, it's what I imagine it would be like. And that's what I turn into. So for my family's sake and my own, I was like, I'm not going to do this. And then I woke up and it was all over my hands and the soles of my feet. And I couldn't walk. Um, and like my body was breaking out in hives <laughs> and, um, then I started steroids and that's why we couldn't have a live. And that's why there was no busy on Saturday because I was busy rage gardening. Um, I just went outside and my family was like, okay, so that's why, and I have these little residual scabs and that's what I just accidentally scratched and got blood on my carpet and all down my leg. Anyway, that was a really fun side tangent. Um, the BSN total joke. If you agree with the fact that the BSN is a total joke, thumbs up. If you disagree, thumbs down. I am very much of the opinion that it could be cool. We could do a lot with it. We could do a lot of learning within those hours. Uh, we just don't, we make it as Sophia says, a lot of extra BS in your BSN. Mel said, while it's far from perfect from a patient advocacy perspective, oh, we're um, back to advocacy of electronic health records. Yes, it is helpful for complex patient care. So we will leave that as an amendment, Mel, in when we change over to paper. Maybe if you're a complex patient, you can keep your electronic health record. We will leave that open for discussion. Um, I learned a whole lot in my BSN program. Great 
program, Ohio University, but was that your BSN classes? So I'm mostly saying those extra classes, those 400 level classes that you have to take your, you know, upper level fluff, um, as I so affectionately cause called them. Um, uh, did you learn anything in those? in those classes that are not part of your core nursing program that are just the fluff, because I sure as heck didn't. Graduating with my BSN in December, had I not had an undergrad degree already and qualified for the ABSN program, I would have rent the ADA en route to save money and then do the BSN part-time while working, yes. And this is a very popular route. So what you can do is you can get your associate's degree at a community college, and then you can bridge ADN to BSN. It's almost always online and boom there you go. Uh, they classes are silly. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, there's magnet hospitals that want you to have your BSN. So there are a lot of, um, uh, magnet hospitals like get money. They give, you have to pay to be a hospital in a magnet thing, but then they like promote you more. So it looks better for patients. And they're like, Oh, look, we have BSN nurses, even though BSN nurses haven't been shown to like actually do anything like different, um, in studies. So the whole topic for a different day. ADN, BSN, MSN, postmasters now done. I can say with authority, the nurse education process needs to be fixed. Yes. Yes, it does. When I rule the world, it will look a lot different. We'll hold a conversation like this and we'll just vote. How are we going to make it different? Some places they pay for ADN to BSN are the same. The only advantage is leadership charge case management role. But on the other hand, magnet hospitals, if you want to work, they require BSN or a specialty. Yes. Um, Yep. They want you to have it because they like to tote that, oh, all of our, most of our nurses are BSNs. So when you're looking for a job uh, in your area, just see, that's another huge deciding factor for like, am I going to get my ADN or my BSN? See what they hire. Like I've worked in a lot of places where they would only hire BSN nurses, even though the people who graduated from the ADN nurses programs were way better, like objectively having trained many of them the ADN ones were way better. Um, but they wouldn't because we were a magnet hospital. So, um, yes, my BSN was BS. Um, Elizabeth Mullen says to Z, hello, family, OU, fellow OU and, um, alum, uh, also something to look for when you are getting a job is see if your hospital will pay, like if they will hire you as an ADN and then pay for your bridge program. Because a lot of places, if you're like, hey, if you hire me as an ADN, within five years, I will go back and get my BSN. And sometimes they'll even pay for it, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, Kariki says, yes, I started with my ADN and spent a lot more clinical time than I observe what BSN students do. When I went back for the BSN, I was underwhelmed, but it opens doors to opportunities. Yes. I will say that um, as my unpopular opinion related to this, my BSN, I have a BSN. I went to an accelerated nursing program. And um, so I feel like I can say this <laughs> because I'm talking about my own self. I thought myself included that BSN students were much more cocky and we were trained. We were given the idea of like, you're a BSN student. You have your bachelor's degree. Like you are the epitome of what we want as a nursing student. We were much more confident and much less clinically prepared than our ADN counterparts who nose to the ground, got through those programs and came out way more actually skilled. Um, but we just thought we were better. So that's not good. And that's been my experience training new nurses as well as the ones that came out of ADN programs were rock stars. Uh, and it seemed like the fancier the school, the more cocky and the less to back that up. <laughs> I was like, Ooh, <laughs> looking at you, University of Michigan. I'm looking at you. <laughs> oh, um, I'm feeling my steroids are giving me, uh, <laughs> giving me all the feelings. BSN gives you more options in your career. Uh, for me, it was worth it. Yes. I, it does give you more options in your career. I'm just saying like that the BSN doesn't provide actual value in itself, if that makes sense. However, for um, two year degree is what's best for them. I have an associate's degree and went back later for a BSN, F MSN, FNP. Yes. No, I totally agree that having your BSN opens a lot of doors. I think that the actual, what you learn in it though is useless. Like we could do so much more. Mama nurse says I started as an ADN and went back for my BSN after a year and a half. I enjoyed my program because of school I went to. However, I don't think it's necessarily needed. There you go. Mama nurse knows all it did provide a lot of background regarding clinical research. I do agree. It was fluff. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> and that's like one of those things where they always, I understand the importance of knowing clinical research, but like 
we don't need that much. You know what I mean? Because most of us aren't actually out doing the research and implementing it. That's like an educator's job, but what do I know? Doing my BSN uh, job because jobs are requiring it more and more. Yes, Angela, they are. Um, let me see. Jessica Langston says, I don't think they should be paid differently or be required versus ADN. And there's a lot of fluff classes, but BSN was a better choice for me because I do want to go back to school for my MSN or DNP. Yes. So then it's a good stepping stone. Um, let us see. I think it's, um, so, uh, second opinion, let me know. Do we agree that the BSN is a complete joke? Um, or not. Uh, Shore says, I think BSN can filter a lot of people out. I think the BSN puts a lot of people at a disadvantage um, in like people who can't afford to go into a BSN program, right. Or can't, don't have that in their realm of access at the point, that point, it filters people into like a total classist system, right. Because you might have people who can, want to become a nurse. So they're like, okay, I can, the ADN program is cheaper. So I'm going to do that. But then they can't work at the big fancy university hospital, right? Because the big fancy university hospital only wants BSN nurses. And they're the ones that are doing like all the tuition reimbursement and all of these things. And so then the, uh, like people who went to an ADN program are going to different hospitals and it's just creating a much bigger schism of like us versus them. Um, and I hate it. Yes. Filters in a bad way for sure. Agree. Agree. All right. I don't think this is going to shock anyone. Here we go. Will BSNs be put to a much better use in Liz's future universe? Yes. Yes, they will. We will actually learn things. Let me know what we should actually learn in these BSN classes. Um, a whole lot. I think we could learn specialties. I think we could just get more clinical hours. I think preceptorships in my perfect world, if you're like, I don't know, in B your BSN, you'd just do like a whole bunch of like job shadowing. Like literally you would just go and do way more of your practicums all there. We would just do that. We would not write papers. We would maybe start therapy. Maybe everyone would like, yeah, you could just go and like learn how to counsel your peers. <laughs> Ther more therapeutic communication, more teaching on education. How do you actually educate patients? How do you um, connect the dots? How do you identify barriers to care better? Just a few small thoughts. Just a few small thoughts. All right, friends, we can do a few more of these. If you like this, we can always do this again. Let me know if you like this format. Um, and we can always do these better uh, because we have a lot more and we've had a lot more conversation than, which is good, than I was anticipating, um, which I love. Uh, but we have a lot more that we didn't get to, which is fine. We'll do one more. And then if you guys did like this, let me know and we can do it again. And if you didn't like it, then just say um, a big fat, um, this. We will not do it again. Okay. <laughs> let me know. Um, let us pick, and I'm going to scroll through and see if I can pick a, a good, um, a good last one. Okay. Here we go. Multivitamins are a scam. <laughs> so multivitamins, um, big feelings, overall initial impressions. Yes, I agree. Multivitamins are mostly a scam. Most people do not need a multivitamin. Okay. Most people, but also there are people who have definite nutritional deficiencies. My issue with a multivitamin is it doesn't give you enough of anything that you actually need. <laughs> so this is my biggest problem with it. I do not recommend my patients take multivitamins because it just lacks enough oomph, right? So most of the time I would say the things that I recommended to my patients we would either notice that they needed to have a calcium supplement, a uh, vitamin D supplement, um, or like a B12 supplement. These things, if they're always best ingested dietarily, vitamin D is a lot harder. Okay. So we might have to supplement that if we want, if like, but that even falls on the, where do you fall on the vitamin D thing? I think vitamin D probably has some merits. I don't know. Um, I just trust the, whatever the American Academy of Family Physicians says about vitamin D, to be honest, because I was like, there's too much conflicting research here. However, most other vitamins you can get through your food, but I understand that we live in a world where not everyone has access to that wide variety of food, right? But multivitamins fall short on pretty much everything. They do not provide you with enough calcium. You do not get enough. Um, you're not like, there's just not enough in them for anything. It's kind of like a, a wimpy little like boof. <laughs> 
in there. It's a waste of money. I would much rather you go and spend the money either on just like calcium with vitamin D. Always take those together, friends. In case you didn't know, vitamin calcium requires vitamin D in order to be absorbed. And your body cannot absorb more than 500 milligrams of calcium at a time. So if you are taking more than 500 milligrams of calcium at a time, which is usually one pill, your body's not absorbing it. You're peeing it out. Better to take it twice a day. Okay. Spread it over the day and make sure you're taking vitamin D with it. So your body actually can do something with it. The, um, uh, the way that, um, sorry, I saw a cloud outside (laughs) ADHD unhinged. That looks exactly like a bunny rabbit. I'm going to take a picture of it for my children. Please pause. Okay. There we go. Um, this is what happens when we're an hour and 15 minutes into a stream. (laughs) I'm sorry. Um, I, where were we? Oh yeah. They don't have enough oomph in them to actually get you anywhere. Let me know if you agree. I think it's a huge, they're not regulated. That's another huge problem. We don't really know what's in them. There's a huge, huge, huge benefit, uh, or like amount of money to be made. And I think people get scammed because they just are like, Oh my gosh. Like, um, you know, they, it has a huge placebo effect. People feel like they're doing something nutritious. You pee out most of them anyway. It's some very, very expensive urine. And a lot of, I've seen people like really mess themselves up with them too. Like I've had people take way too much vitamin E and then anticoagulate themselves. And you're like, Oh my goodness gracious. Um, so no, uh, Elizabeth Mullen says, I feel like they give people too much certain things and not enough of other things. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Lauren Kelly says they always throw like 833% of B6 and where's the potassium? Yeah. They're not balanced. They're, they're just a mess. Kimberly Austin disagrees. She says, I love vitamins. I'm a vitamin queen. I get B complex when I go to the IV hydration spa and it makes a big difference. If it makes a big difference to you, you keep doing you. Um, I wonder if you were here for, were you here when we were talking about IV hydration? I have big feelings about IV hydration. (laughs) Um, kind of ties into this. Um, but if it makes you feel better, you do you friend, um, multivitamin is not needed in multiple ways. Yes. Agree. Also for children that like all, um, parents, uh, most kids don't need a multivitamin unless they are lacking, like, unless they're super duper picky eaters. And then I would be like, okay, like maybe we should look into that because while mac and cheese is glorious, it doesn't quite do everything. Um, Kimberly Austin (laughs) said, no, I wasn't. Yeah. Um, I don't like them, but you can go back and watch that. But again, the whole point of this is just for fun. You agree. You disagree. Where are we? Um, So yeah, I would say overall multivitamins, huge scam. Most vitamins, huge scam. Some of them are shown to have some benefit uh, for sure. So I'm not like anti all vitamins, but targeted specific therapies um, are mostly the way to go. A thousand percent vitamin A, P, yes very, very expensive P my PCP agrees. I'm glad. Um, I'm glad another primary care person out there agrees. It always makes me feel better. Uh, Mama nurse says everyone, make sure you leave a like on this video. Yes. Friends. If you like this, please like it. It raises the vital signs of the video and it tells the YouTube gods, um, to show this to more people and it makes me happy. So I appreciate you. Um, uh, let me see. And Um, if you're watching this on the replay, leave a comment that also makes the YouTube gods happy. And if you want fun emojis, you can join this beautiful list of people, um, and become a channel member and you get random video perks and you get fun emojis. I mean, what's not to love? (laughs) What is not to love? Um, and you get to see more random, much more distracted videos, which might also turn most of you off. And you're like, why would I want that? (laughs) This is too much. All right, friends. Let us see. Um, by Teresa Madison says by USP validated vitamins. I think that is, I forget the, um, some kind of a USP validated can be purchased at Costco. Um, I'm honestly not like, uh, I'll have to look into that. I feel like I've heard of that before as like a way to verify them. I don't know wildly, um, a ton about, all vitamins. I had like ones that when I recommended vitamin D or B12 or like this, I had like a list I gave to my patients. I think it might be in my NP binder of like brands that I, um, had, I liked that were affordable, um, that I found from a, a pharmacist in my school, uh, when I was in NP school, she had given it to us. She was like a 
pharmacist. She worked at, I don't even know where, I think at the school, she was a really great pharmacology teacher, like phenomenal. She's who taught them med school. And then she came over and taught us in NP school and she was amazing. And she like gave us a good guideline of all that, but all that to say, I like targeted approach to vitamins. So not just, um, all over U S pharmacopoeia. Is that how you pronounce that? Maybe don't know anything about it. So research at your own risk friends. All right. What do we think? Multivitamins are a scam. Oh, you might hear my pterodactyl children screaming. That means it's almost time to go. There we go. Multivitamins are a scam. Agree. Good. Okay. Multivitamins. eh, You're not allowed in Liz's universe. We will have targeted therapy. Okay. Uh, Jackie said, I always recommend iron for all women of childbearing age. And of course, prenatals for folic acid, especially when pregnant or pre-pregnant. Um, yes. So I personally don't, a lot of people recommend iron, um, for people of childbearing age. Cause if you're having your period, um, I usually tell people with uteruses, if you're having your period and you like we and you can always try iron. I don't love iron to be honest, because iron, um, makes you, it can make your stomach pretty upset. Uh, And people generally don't tolerate it like exceptionally, and it can be quite expensive. Um, But if you are someone who tends to be iron deficient anemia, if you have really heavy periods, if they're very long, um, then that can be very, very helpful. And that's when you would like do a targeted like, hey, let's do some iron for you um, and make sure to take your iron with um, something like ascorbic acid, uh, vitamin C, something to make it absorb. Because again, if not, it just falls flat. And if someone ever tries to sell you like iron fusion, you can, that's basically just a combination of the vitamin C and the iron. And you can just do that yourself with like orange juice, or you can buy the pill separately. And it's much cheaper, just fun facts. Um, so that's always something to look into. I didn't tell everybody to, but again, this is the art of everyone gets to practice in a little bit of a different way and see what works best for them. Um, and technically the recommendation is to take uh, folic acid, Anytime you could possibly become pregnant. Um, I'm bad at that. (laughs) I never did that. Um, that is technically the recommendation though. And that is very correct. I just found it wasn't very (laughs) helpful. Um, in terms of like the follow through on my patients was just low on that. Um, and Lauren Kelly, yes, it also iron can cause a lot of constipation. I have had pretty poor luck. You have to like, make sure you're like eating, like you have to eat with, it's just kind of like a mess. My patients did not tolerate iron very well. Uh, and yeah, Marion King. So I, that was, I never like across the board recommended it, but who knows? Maybe that's, something to look into. Marion King said after allergy testing, realized there are reasons multivitamins never agreed with me. Oh dear. (laughs) Oh dear. Um, that's yeah, that's not something you ever want to find out that you're anaphylactic to a bunch of stuff in your multivitamin. Teresa Madison says iron infusion have a high risk of anaphylaxis. Yeah. And they like, if you're doing an iron infusion, that's even different and you can get it like under your skin and it discolors it and it's really painful and yuck. All right, friends. Um, we've got some new rules that I'm excited to implement in our future kingdom. Uh, so we will be allowing messy buns, very important rule. We will be bringing back paper charting, which I think that one might be more, our most contentious one. We will be allowing people to make choices about their own bodies, but we will be educating them a whole lot better regarding end of life care. What else have we decided? We're not going to be selling multivitamins. No, no. And we will not be having IV hydration spots. No, 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 no. You will not be getting those here. Um, might have to go elsewhere. Um, what else did, uh, we decide? We decided that your BSN was going to be put to much better work. We're currently workshopping what we're going to do with the extra BSN classes, but it will not be research friends. It will not be research. And is there anything else that we decided? Let's look through real quick. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, at PA, NP school needs to learn a lot from PA school. Okay. And don't go to the chiropractor. <laughs> good. Perfect. Oh, and we will not be wearing masks mandated, but we do encourage you to wear them if you don't feel good. I think that sets some very good baseline things. Um, I look forward to the next time we convene as a party. If you guys liked this, we can reconvene, get more opinions, um, and figure out what our future kingdom is going to look like. I appreciate all of your insight in being here. Um, do do as second opinion says, and remember to like, and share if you want the video to have a part two, that does help me and YouTube know that this is good. Um, and yes, 
remember patient education is key because like Katina said, I took iron for years and it didn't work because I wasn't told about the vitamin C. Just like calcium, friends. You got to, you got to, some vitamins need buddies, but we don't, since we just don't get a lot of education on vitamin, like the whole thing's a mess, but we need to do better education to teach the people, to teach the healthcare providers how to teach their patients about how to take their medicines all goes back to the teaching, right? Okay. Um, perfect. Uh, Lauren Kelly, I'm glad you love the format. I am glad you are all here. Liz's kingdom. We have to come up with a better name. I that's, it's too, it's a little bit too narcissist. Um, a little bit too narcissistic. All right, friends. Thanks for being here. I hope you know. Oh, I'm trying to get the vitamins to come off. It's so aggressive. It's like vitamins are a scam. Okay. All right, friends. I so appreciate you for being here. I hope you have a beautiful rest of your afternoon slash evening since we're pretending this is a light night with Liz. I hope you always know that you are more, more than enough, even if you enjoy multivitamins and go have, um, IV vitamins put into you. It's still okay. You are more than enough. You are not alone and you, my friends can do hard things. Bye friends.